Well, if you don't have an outline, these gentlemen will uh, give you one. You're probably wondering, we're starting the sermon at 11.40, am I going to get out for lunch on time? And you will, don't worry, it's all been thought out. A baby's concept, a baby's concept of imminence is a lot like a Christian's concept of imminence. Not long after Noah was born, did Esther and I realize that babies have relatively no concept of something about to happen. Imminence is an adjective that simply means something is about to happen. It is near, at hand, forthcoming, expected, looming, impending. Babies have no concept of imminence. Words that babies, the words I just said, they don't understand that. So you can't just say, the food is imminent, Noah. He doesn't understand what that means. No matter how hard you try to create the perfect environment for the baby, no matter how hard you try to make sure the carrier doesn't rattle, the baby always wakes up and wants food. And you can't say, hold on, wait. They just don't understand. Absolutely no concept of imminence. It proves almost futile sometimes, I found, to even try to calm the baby down. Shh, it's going to be okay. Daddy's going to get you some food. Shh. The baby's not willing to commit to a formal conversation about something that's forthcoming, does not work. And he responds back, you know, as I think sometimes as if he were to respond back, yeah, yes, Father, I can see that you're trying to calm me. I will wait upon you since I can see that you're trying to accommodate me. That's not how it works. I just, I don't know why nobody told me that before we had Noah, but. <laughs> we find ourselves as Christians in situations of imminence all the time. Think about the last time you waited in a line at a store or at the bank or at the gas station. When we're third in line, there's this feeling, this surge of energy that comes in us, it increases. We're very excited that we're about to be second. And when we get second, the surge of energy gets even more intense, it gets stronger. And then finally, the surge of energy bursts when we're the next person to get the gas or to be served by the teller or to check out at the store. The Christian life is marked by imminence as well. Things that are about to happen. You perhaps have heard the statement, you're either in a difficult circumstance now, you're out of one, or about to be in one. There's only three kind of circumstances that you can live in. Difficult circumstances are all around us about to happen to us. In fact, the problem with imminence is that sometimes we don't see difficult things coming. We're sometimes blindsided by them. But God has wired us to feel imminence for a very important reason. Imminence is the key to Christian growth. Imminence is the key to Christian growth. That something is about to happen is key to my growth, to your growth as a Christian. Feeling that Something is near gives us a pressure, a good pressure that we should be holy or that we should be obedient. In the text this morning, we see that the coming of the Lord is imminent. The coming of the Lord is imminent and as a result of his imminence, the coming of the Lord, we should be ready, we should be holy, we should be obedient. We know that the coming of the Lord will come upon us like a thief in the night. We know that it will be glorious. We know that Christ will descend with the sound of a trumpet. We know that it will be majestic. We know that Christ will be fully visible for all the nations to see. We know that we will be transformed when we see him. We know that we will be with him forever. We know that he will make all things new, completely transforming the heavens and the earth that we see with our very own eyes. And we know that he will reign forever as the rightful king. The coming of the Lord is imminent. We know the coming of the Lord is imminent. But 
often our eminence meter is out of sync. We're just like a baby. We don't know when it's coming. We don't know what to do as we wait for its coming. The problem James wants us to see is that though we know the Lord is coming back one day, we don't seem to think it is imminent. Or if we do think it is imminent, we don't take it very seriously. This is much less true when we think of the world at large. Humans have a tendency to be impatient, restless, craving and desiring everything immediately. The latest iPhone. Did you know people sleep in tents outside of Best Buy to get an iPhone that they'll end up giving away to a less like member of their family, a least favorite member of their family, in order to get another iPhone in three months? I'm not judging, just an observation of how the world works. <laughs> Here's the problem James wants us to see very clearly. Though the problem of imminence is certainly pervasive in culture around us, people feel trapped if they don't have what they want, when they want it, however they want it. It has seeped into the church in some pretty catastrophic ways. This lack of imminence. Have we forgotten that to be a disciple of Christ is to persevere in obedience? Have we forgotten that vengeance is the Lord's, that we should not repay evil for evil? Have we forgotten to suffer well? Have we forgotten that it is more blessed to suffer for Christ's sake than to enjoy the comfort of this world? Have we forgotten the primacy and the urgency of evangelism and mission? Have we forgotten the importance of church unity and peace? Most importantly, have we forgotten that the coming of the Lord is imminent? It is at hand. It is here. It is standing at the door. These are the questions James wants us to think about this morning. So I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to James chapter 5, verse 7 to 12. James chapter 5, verse 7 to 12. This is what God's word says. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until... It receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. You see the review that's right after the passage. We're going to look over that in the coming weeks, so I invite you to just take that home. The answers are there for you. But you'll notice some preliminary observations about James chapter 5, verse 7 to 12. You'll notice some preliminary observations. First, notice the therefore. What is the therefore, therefore? It connects the previous passage, the one we looked at last week, with the command to be patient. And last week we saw that gaining wealth, taking advantage of other people, and even committing fraud and theft deserves God's punishment. And the very next verse after that, ch- after that section is the verse that we s- just read, verse seven, be patient. You see people committing fraud, you see people committing theft, you see people taking advantage of you, what should you do? Be patient. The therefore connects the previous passage with the command to be patient. You are not to take matters into your own hands. You are to be patient, to wait upon the Lord. But notice also that the coming of the Lord is the central thrust of this text. It is the central thrust of the text. James mentions it four times. In verse seven, he says, until the coming of the Lord, and notice how the progression moves closer and closer in proximity, imminent, more and more imminent. Until the coming of the Lord in verse 7. In verse 8, notice how it says that the Lord is at hand. 
right here, arm, arm reach. But then in verse 9, notice that the judge, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, is standing at our door. So the level of proximity. And then finally, notice in verse 12, that we might fall under condemnation, that God himself, moving from the door to our presence, will condemn us if we live in sin. So let's make some key observations of James chapter 5, verse 7 to 12. James chapter 5, verse 7 to 12. The first thing we want to observe, number one, is that the coming of the Lord moves us to patience. The coming of the Lord moves us to patience. Uh, James has used this word patient and steadfast several times throughout this text, six times. And so he, he is using them interchangeably. To be patient is to be steadfast. To be steadfast is to be patient. He's using them interchangeably to teach us three things, I think. Three things. He does this through illustrations. He's a good teacher. He tells you the truth, the abstract truth, and then he gives you concrete examples. So that's what we need. I need concrete examples to ground the teaching of James. So number one, the farmer. Number two, the prophet. And number three, Job. The farmer, the prophet, and Job. Look at the point of, it, of his first example. The farmer teaches us that Christian patience is fruitful and active. Notice what he says in verse 7. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. It is fruitful. He's waiting for something to happen. But notice also that while he's patient, he is not passive. He is active. He is active. Often we confuse patience with passivity as though what Jesus wants us to do is become stargazers, to just set up camp on the beach and spread our arms and look up to the heavens and say, whenever you're coming back, Lord, I'm here at your disposal, passively awaiting. No sacrifice, just kind of gazing. Well, that's not useful. Scott just talked about how we need to go to the ends of the world. Jesus himself says, until everybody has heard with their ears the gospel, the gospel message, I will not come back. So if you're a Christian here and you long for the coming of the Lord Jesus, you will prove it through action. You will say, I want Jesus to come back. I'm on the next plane to wherever. I mean, you send me wherever you want. You know, two billion people have not heard the gospel yet. Two billion people left. And then Jesus come back. Let's, let's do it as quickly as possible. Let's be urgent. The farmer waits, but he plans. Notice how it says that he is patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. And when he receives the early rains, he would plant because the ground would be soft enough to plant the seed. And then he would wait again, cultivating that ground till the second rain came. And then that would bring the growth and then he would have to take it all up harvest all of it, and then do it all over again. Farmers are very active people, and Christians should not be less active than farmers. So the, the point of the first example is that Christian patience is fruitful and active. Another text that I think will help be helpful, we will, will not read it today, is Luke 12, 35 to 40. Read Luke 12, 35 to 40. Also, 2 Peter 3, 2 Peter 3, 8 to 14. The gist of those passages is that Christ is coming back. We don't know when, but we have to be active. We have to wait for him with our eyes open, with diligence, with urgency, with holiness, with purity. So our business as we wait for the coming of the Lord is busy. We will be busy. But the point of example number two is a bit more convoluted. It's a little bit more complicated. In verse 10, you see there that he says, take as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. What are we to gather from this? What is the point of this example, the prophets? Well, Christian patience is prophetic. It speaks in the name of the Lord. Christian patience speaks in the name of the Lord. It's prophetic and deadly. Christian patience is deadly. If it's prophetic, it has to be deadly. People will not like the gospel. I was just at a restaurant the other day, and I kindly asked our waitress, 
so I noticed that you have a tattoo that says, the Lord is my shepherd. Are you a Christian? And she looked at me and said, no. And then she just walked away. We have to be ready for people to reject us, to reject our appeals to the gospel. So Christian patience is prophetic and deadly. Consider Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the prophet, wrote the longest book, is often known as the weeping uh, prophet who wrote the longest prophetic work in the Old Testament. He was threatened with death and mocked and imprisoned. He was prevented from marrying a woman as a sign against Israel, left to be lonely for the rest of his life. God did that to him, by the way. If you read in Jeremiah 16, he gladly obeyed. Jeremiah was constantly rejected by everybody, including his family. He was a prophet for over 40 years, but only saw two converts. His messages were not well received. His hometown plotted to kill him. And you know what his response was? Continue preaching God's word if it cost me my life, which it eventually did. But Christian patience is prophetic and deadly. Ezekiel is another prophet who showed perseverance in great trial. Ezekiel lost his wife and God told him, do not mourn for her. I do not allow you to mourn for her. You know what I want you to do? Put on festal garments, put on joyful garments, celebrate. Can you imagine? Your spouse dies and God says, celebrate? It's Ezekiel chapter 24. God tells him your wife is gonna die and he says, do not practice the customs of mourning. I want you to celebrate. You know what Ezekiel did? 24, 18, Ezekiel 24, 18. So I spoke to the people in the morning. He told the people that his wife died. And at evening, or that she was about to die, and at evening my wife died. And on the next morning, I did as I was commanded. How many of you would give up your spouse for the kingdom of Christ? How many of us are willing to make great sacrifices, to be prophetic, to experience death. These are just two examples that James calls us to consider, brothers and sisters. He calls us to consider these examples because he knows that when we do, we'll get away from the culture's dream, American dream of early retirement and funds for the rest of our lives. He knows that when he challenges us with these truths, something will hit us across the head a weight of bricks will fall on us that will say, wake up, smell the roses, we've got work to do. So James is, is telling us, you wanna be a Christian? You wanna have patience? It's gonna be prophetic and it'll be costly, it'll be deadly. But point number three is important as well. He asks us, in verse 11 to consider Job. He says, consider Job. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Christian patience is trusting and purposeful. Christian patience is trusting and purposeful. You all know what happened to Job. Job was allowed to be inflicted by, by God through Satan, God used Satan to afflict Job. Never gives us a reason why. There's no reason why God did that to Job. Absolutely no reason why in the book. Never tells us. You know what it tells us? That Job had a wrong perspective on God's justice and how he works in this world. God corrected his wrong view. Job repented and God blessed him. He said, God, I'm wrong. I was wrong. You're right. I don't have a universal perspective on the world. I can't even control my own children and their fate. How much more do you control the universe and seven billion people? I'm trusting you, God. And so the example of Job is calling us to trust in God in the midst of hardship, but it's also calling us to be purposeful. 
seeing that our suffering is meant to show us the mercy and the compassion of God. It's purposeful. You see there? That is the end of Job's suffering, right? Verse 11, you have seen the purpose, the end, the goal of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Which leads us to the next part of this text. The coming of the Lord teaches us to be patient, moves us to patience, but it also motivates our holiness. The coming of the Lord motivates our holiness. There's two negative commands. I just read one. The first one is found in verse 9, do not grumble against one another. The second is found in verse 12, do not swear, but let your yes be yes and no be no. Uh, This swearing is not profanity, uh, though it can be profane. Swearing, Swearing is particularly religious speech, speech that you use to underline something truthful that you're saying. Not that swearing is in and of itself wrong. God swears in the Old and the New Testament by his own name. Jesus himself swears, makes an oath to God. Paul makes oaths to God. Uh, In fact, James is actually highlighting a truth that Jesus himself taught in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. But Jesus adds there that anything that goes beyond our faithfulness, our truthfulness, is from evil, is from this evil one, from Satan. So the concern for Jesus and for James is that we be truthful. Do not grumble and do not be untruthful. Do not make oaths that you cannot keep. Throughout James' letter, he's been concerned with speech. This is not a surprise. So I think for Christians, it's okay to use oaths for solemn purposes, like when you take an office in a church or when we covenant together as a church or when you are getting married or when you're giving testimony in court. Because what's happening there is a very significant and recognized authority that is keeping you accountable to your promises. Uh, the, The only problem, I think, comes when we begin to make oaths in our difficulties that we will not keep. Let me give you an example of this. God, if you get me the extra money to pay bills this month, it's really hard, I will blank for you. God, I'm so lonely and single. If, if only you make her or him notice me, my husband and wife, I will do blank for you. God, if you heal me, I will blank for you. God, if you get me that brand new car, I will blank for you. I swear to God. Brother, sister, these types of commitments our lives. Jesus showed his disciples that on the same, in the same sentence when Pharisees were saying, I will praise God, they were being hypocritical. Israel said, I will praise you in the Old Testament. And all of the narrative shows that was a lie, big fat lie. They broke their oath, they were cursed by God because they did not meet their end of the bargain. They did not faithfully obey God. So we make oaths. We need to be careful with with saying things like, I I swear to God, and and being flippantly uh, making oaths and using using it casually in our speech. An, An example of a good oath would be signing the covenant of Sheridan Hills Baptist Church as a member. When we sign our church covenant, what we are saying to other members of this church that we're covenanting with, that we're together with, We are communicating to them, brother, sister, so help me God, if I fail in any of these areas, you have absolute liberty to confront me. Signing a church covenant is important because we are making sure that we are holding our promises since we are so often in the tendency to not keep them. That keeps us united, it keeps us bonded. If you see brothers and sisters committing sin, you need to confront them in love and in kindness. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ, no need for condemnation. We're free from condemnation. That is not what the Bible says when we ought to confront one another. We ought to confront one another in love to restore, to build up. And so making oaths to each other as a church community is very biblical. It is very honoring to Christ. In one sense, as Christians, we give our whole lives over to Jesus when we've converted and baptized. Our baptism is an oath 
saying that we have been baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So in a sense, every word I speak from now on will be true. So help me God. I am baptized. So all of our words are supported by that authority of baptism. It is by that confidence, that intention, as best as we can tell, our whole lives will be lived to him. That is what we're confessing when we baptize people. We're saying this person is professing Christ and rejecting the world. This is why baptism and membership in a local church is so meaningful. If you get a chance to to join the upcoming starting point, I encourage you to do that. It's so meaningful when we see baptism and membership in a local church because we're publicly professing Christ, but we're being affirmed by the church. This body of believers has the responsibility to make sure that we are publicly professing Christ. That is, brother and sister, your responsibility as a member of this church. That is not just the pastor's responsibility. We are members of this church, but it is our responsibility together to keep one another accountable. So baptism is the public profession that I am with Christ. Church membership is the public profession that I have covenanted with these people, and I am willing to go to the ends of the world to save brothers and sisters who have fallen away. That is our oath when we sign the church covenant. So I strongly encourage you to do that. Bless other brothers and sisters by doing that. Friend, if you're here and you're not a Christian, I wonder if you've considered that God will judge you for every word you speak. That's what the Bible teaches. Suppose I could take a sentence from this past week that you spoke either to your spouse, to your boss, to your children, and say in this very moment I can project it, broadcast it, tweet so that the world can see what you said. The level of embarrassment you'll feel is nothing compared to the embarrassment you'll feel when you stand before God to be judged for every word you've said. Think about that embarrassment and think about the guilt and the shame. Think about that broadcast just being repeated endlessly. You said this. You're guilty. The Bible teaches us that God is a holy God who is willing to judge us for every word we've spoken. And the problem is that we are created in his image, but we are sinful. And so if you doubt that you've ever sinned, thought experiment, replay a sentence in the back of your mind from this past week, maybe today on your way to church, I know that we have sinned with our words. The Bible says that we sin with our words. With the same mouth we confess Christ, and the same mouth we curse our brothers. And so James is saying, look at your life. My Christian friend, I urge you to take from this verse this challenge. The challenge that you have spoken the truth, you have been committed and you have been consistent with your promises. Are you known in your family, at at work, at school, to be somebody who's consistent, who will keep your bond? What about at church? Now, a great way to figure out if you're a good volunteer at this church is to ask the person who recruited you to volunteer. Ask them, say, hey, am I a good volunteer? The answer might be revealing. You might find that, no, you show up 15 minutes late and you are often abrasive toward parents. Or you might find, You serve very gladly. Praise God. I challenge you to do that today. If you volunteer at any capacity in our church, I challenge you to go to those who recruit you and say, am I a joy to work with? Do I make good on my promises? Am I consistent? So do that now. Do that with Gladys. Do that with Laura. Some of you I've asked to volunteer. You can do that with me. I've volunteered with some of you. I'll be more than glad to do that. The point is that we need to be truthful. We need to be committed to our words. Did you notice the purpose of these two commands? Did you notice that in verse 9 and 12? The reason why we should not grumble or be untruthful is that we might be judged for being grumbling and being untruthful. The purpose for why we should not swear is in verse 12, so that we might not fall under condemnation. He's not talking to non-Christians. He's talking to Christians. Friend, I I wonder if it surprises you that James is using this language towards Christian, towards Christians. He's using the the word brothers several times in this passage, so we're assuming that he's talking to Christians. 
This is simply a term of endearment, a term that he, he's saying to them, I love you, brother, enough to tell you that you're in sin. You're going to be judged if you don't turn around. Perhaps you're not a Christian. And it may surprise you that, that a Christian is telling another group of Christians that they might face God's judgment if they don't obey God's commands. That might surprise you. You may be wondering why it's right for God to treat his people this way. After all, you may be thinking that if God will judge even those who claim to be his people, that he isn't really loving and merciful after all. But don't miss the values of these verses. We live in a society that turns a blind eye to injustice every single day. Every single day, we see the society we live in turn a blind eye to justice. Wrongs committed against others and ourselves. In James 5, 1 to 6, we've already looked at the wealthy taking advantage of the poor. Fraud, deceit, murder, sex trafficking. Injustices committed every single day. And society turns a blind eye to them. So then it is good news that God will not turn a blind eye to injustice. It is good news that God will hold everybody accountable for every single injustice that they've ever committed. Every single person will give an account for every single deed. And the greatest wrong committed is not fraud. It's not theft. It's not even sex trafficking. The greatest problem is that we've offended a holy God. We've rejected God. We've rejected the only one who can excuse us and show us mercy. We've said, nope, I don't want that. He's our creator. He created us and designed us for fellowship with him. But we have turned away. We've rejected him. We thought other things would bring us more pleasure. Now, it would be perfectly just for God to execute judgment. Wouldn't you if your creation turned against you? Perfectly right for God to do this. And so, at the right time, when we were sinners, when we were enemies, under God's just condemnation, Jesus of Nazareth showed up, lived a perfect life, fully obedient to God, called upon God in trust in his great difficulty and circumstance, even while on the cross, in our place, Jesus shouted, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Not doubting God's goodness, but trusting that what God said would come to pass from Psalm 22, that Jesus Christ on the cross is the king of the world. He said, uh, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus said that in trust, knowing that he would be raised from the dead. Read Psalm 31. And so Jesus is raised from the dead three days later after his death. And he appears to several hundred people who witness him, eyewitness accounts, historical facts. And then he leaves, he ascends into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of the Father, exercising perfect judgment, the seat of highest authority. So he invites us this morning to repent of our sin, to repent because we have offended God, and then to trust that what Jesus did for us on the cross will offer forgiveness, will offer freedom from shame and guilt, and will give us the lasting pleasure and joy that we long for. I invite you, brother and sister, to repent, to turn from your sin, to instead turn to Christ and trust, say, Lord, I trust you. I have sinned. I've offended you. Lord, forgive me. Friend, if you're not a Christian, I invite you to come and believe the gospel. I invite you to cling to Christ and his promises. The world will forsake you, but Christ will never. He always makes good on his promises. That brings us to our conclusion here that the coming of the Lord not only moves us to patience, it not only motivates our holiness, but it marks our approval before God. The coming of the Lord Jesus marks our approval before God. You probably noticed in verse 11 that James says, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. Now, 
this is very interesting that James is using this language because several times throughout this letter, he is ref referring back to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. In the earlier part of his letter, James writes in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 12, Blessed is the man, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. This is a direct connection to Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Later on in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus will reinforce this coming of the Lord, his, his return, with a promise. This is in Matthew 24, verse 9 to 14. He's talking to his disciples and he says, they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you will be hated by all nations for my namesake. <laughs> this is the job description of a disciple of Christ, right? <laughs> the, this, the, the job description is, hey, you're gonna die and everybody's gonna hate you. You good? We've shifted from this job description in our current context, haven't we? This is not what we often think about Christians in our society. Christians are good moral people who, you know, kind of vote the certain way and dress a certain way and look a certain way. And that might be true, but ultimately our allegiance is to Christ and that might mean our lives are at stake. In verse 10 of chapter 24, he says, and then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures, the one who endures, the one who's steadfast, the one who's patient, that one will be saved. The one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. We've got a lot, to work, a lot of work to do, brothers and sisters. Two billion people that do not know the gospel. If you want this end to come, we need to go. We need to work. We need to be active. We need to share the gospel. What I think Jesus is saying here is that the coming, his coming is imminent. And that surrounding his coming will be a great level of suffering and persecution. Christians will be delivered up and they will be hated by the nations for his sake. Many professing Christians will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many false teachers will arise, not forcibly, but as 2 Timothy 4 says, because professing Christians want to gather for themselves people who will scratch their ears and tell them pleasant things. It's catastrophic. And because lawlessness increases, love grows cold. And here's Jesus' promise to his disciples, the one who endures will be saved. He doesn't say might be saved. He doesn't say perhaps will be saved. He says will be saved. And further, the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed. It will go forth throughout the nations and then the end will come. Listen, God will use you or not but his purposes will be fulfilled. We need to submit to what God is calling us to do, but God will further and accomplish his purposes, whether we like it or not. The world will see the nations coming to Christ. There will be great tribulation, and it's all part of God's plan. But how does the coming of the Lord mark our approval? It is blessed to suffer. It is blessed to remain steadfast. And this word blessed marks those who God has approved of. When we praise God, we say to God, you are the only one who has my affection. When God blesses us, when he praises us, if you read the Psalms, it's because he says, I am committed to you. 
you are approved. And what a great standing to have as a, as a Christian, to know that the king of the universe has approved of me, has said his blessing upon me, has said, this is momentary affliction. You are blessed. You are approved. You are marked by me. Being marked by the approval of God gives us an unshakable joy and longing. Listen to how John describes this in 1 John chapter 3. Beloved, we are God's children now. Marked. We are his children. And what we will be has not yet appeared. What we will be has not yet appeared. But know that when he appears, we shall be like him because he sh we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. The coming of the Lord is imminent. It is going to happen soon. The coming of the Lord means that we will be moved to patience, motivated to holiness, and marked as approved before God. This means our, our faith will be active and diligent. It means that we will be prophetic and sacrifice our lives. And it also means that the purpose will be accomplished. God will make us holy, and God will turn the nations to himself through us. May God continue to give us the strength to think this way until Christ's return. Amen. Let us pray.